Welcome to Macro Musings, the podcast series where each week we pull back the curtain and take a closer look at the important macroeconomic issues of the past, present, and future. I'm your host, David Beckworth of the Mercatus Center. We are glad you've decided to join us. Our guest today is Jeffrey Rogers Hummel. Jeff is a professor of economics at San Jose State University and writes on macroeconomics and economic history. He joins us today to discuss his work on the crisis, interest rates, and currency. Jeff, welcome to the show. It's a pleasure to be on the show. Oh, it's a treat to have you on. You've written some interesting pieces lately that we're going to get into. Before we do that, I would like to know, how did you get into economics? Well, as you know, my PhD is actually in history. But when I was doing my undergraduate work at Grove City College, um, I was there at at the time when Hans Senholtz, a student of Mises, was uh, teaching. And they also, in the... uh, in the history department, they also had Clarence Carson, who regularly wrote for the Freeman uh, of the Foundation for Economic Education. So I, I took as many Senholz's classes as I could, and um, <clears throat> because I realized that you can't really do history unless you understand economics. And then when I got out of the um, Army and started graduate school at the University of Texas. I took a lot of economics, graduate economics courses, economic history from Gary Walton, from surprisingly Walt Rostow. Hmm. (laughs) And I took monetary theory and macro. And then when I uh, was getting ready to do my orals, I asked them to let me minor in one of the three. Um, comp areas in the economics department. So I essentially majored in history and minored in economics uh, in my graduate work. And then finally, after being ABD for many years, when I got around to doing my dissertation, it was on the economics of slavery. And even though it was at the University of Texas, I had to have an economist on my uh, dissertation committee and uh, and had the honor of having Milton Friedman uh, be on my dissertation committee. So as I began, when I get back, got back into teaching, it turned out that I could teach both history and economics. I've taught both, but there were more jobs teaching economics. <laughs> okay. And you've gone on to write a lot in the field of money and banking and macroeconomics. And we're going to post these three articles that we're going to discuss today on the SoundCloud webpage. But that's a fascinating journey into economics. And I want to go ahead and jump in to the first article I wanted to discuss with you. And this is the article you wrote that was titled Ben Bernanke versus Milton Friedman, the Federal Reserve's Emergence as the U.S. Economy's Central Planner. Now, in that article, you begin with a quote that Ben Bernanke gave at a speech at Milton Friedman's 90th birthday celebration. And the quote from Ben Bernanke goes as follows. I would like to say to Milton and Anna regarding the Great Depression, you're right. We did it. We're very sorry, but thanks to you, we won't do it again. Okay, so uh, how has history judged that statement? Well, both agree. I mean, in fact, most economists agree with Friedman um, that what made the Great Depression great was Mm -hmm. the banking panics that began um, a year after the stock market crash. But um, there's disagreement about why the banking panics made the Great Depression great. And to put it in simple terms, Friedman's view was that the banking panics were uh, a negative shock to the money supply, a negative shock to aggregate demand. And therefore, uh, to avoid the severity of the depression, it would have been sufficient to have Um, a more expansionary monetary policy on the part of the Federal Reserve that would have prevented the decline. Uh, uh, M2 fell by about one-third, M1 fell by about 25%. Whereas Bernanke's view is that the banking panics were essentially a shock to financial intermediation, um, knocking out these crucial um, institutions in the flow of savings, and therefore the policy implication of that is not an increase in the money stock or only an increase in the money stock, but targeted bailouts to specific institutions. And so I think that's a significant difference in terms of the policy implications. So Milton Friedman viewed the Great Depression 
as a medium of exchange crisis. The money supply, a large part of it disappeared. That had real consequences versus Bernanke focusing on the breakdown of financial intermediation. That right. was that was the key shock. Okay. Yes. That's that's okay. So, and that ultimately is what you argue in your article is what drove the response of the Ben Bernanke uh, Federal Reserve in 2008, 2009, and so on. Yeah. Well, actually, the response begins uh, in in August of uh, of uh, 2007. Well, tell us about when that. He, yeah. uh, well, he he started the the first um, basically. In, in, in August in 2007, you begin to see, as Gary Gorton has pointed out, you begin to see a panic in the uh, repo market and the asset-backed commercial paper markets. And so the first thing that Bernanke does is he eases up on uh, discounts, um, trying to encourage banks and to a certain extent does encourage banks to borrow more money. Um, and then in December, he creates the term auction facility, which is designed to uh, get uh, financial institutions to uh, borrow even uh, more money. And if you look at the balance sheet of the Fed, as the borrowing from the Fed um, increases, Bernanke sterilizes uh, that by uh, selling off treasury securities. So there is n no significant change uh, either in the size of the Fed's balance sheet or in the monetary base. And that's that's phase one of that his response. And he continues that um, <clears throat> until October of 2008. And by that time, uh, the Fed is beginning to run out of Treasury securities that it can sell off uh, to sterilize the bailouts. And so that's when you get quantitative easing coupled with the paying of interest on uh, reserves. Let's let's look a little bit closer at that phase one you just outlined. So between August 2007 and the end of 2008, right when QE1 starts, what you're saying is that the Bernanke Federal Reserve, and we're saying Bernanke, but obviously it was more than just him. as everyone on board who voted for these policies. What they did was sterilize lending. So for every dollar they lent out to banks in distress, they also took a dollar out of circulation. Is that what you're saying? Yes, and they exactly. did that. They did that by selling off some of their treasury securities. Exactly. Yes. And it, and they did and they did that because Bernanke was, um, you know, has always been an inflation targeter, and he was worried about um, an increase in the monetary base, uh, um, setting off uh, an increase in the rate of inflation. Yeah, so I guess what's interesting about that is, you know, during this period, there was obviously financial stress by then. And in 2008, we know the economy was contracting. And what they were doing was they were keeping the level of the monetary base stable up until late 2008 by, by doing this sterilized lending. At a time where you think it would probably be important to expand the monetary base, that in, in the sense that the demand for liquidity has gone up. It's, it's a stressful environment. Financial conditions are worsening. And... The Bernanke Fed is effectively picking and choosing where credit gets allocated, but it's not expanding overall the amount of, of money available. Exactly. Yes, right. And I, again, that goes back to what you mentioned earlier, that it's it's a different view of the crisis. So it, right. it, makes, it makes sense if you view the crisis as a financial intermediation shock versus a, a money or medium of exchange shock. So... What what should he have done, I guess, kind of going back to this critique, what should he have done during phase one instead of sterilized lending? Well, I think he should have done exactly what uh, Greenspan did uh, mm -hmm. when he faced, you know, Greenspan during, during his long reign at the Fed uh, faced three potential crises. Uh, first of all, the, the stock market uh, crash of, of um, <clears throat> October uh, – uh, 1987, just after he's uh, appointed, and then Y2K and 9/11, and what you see in each of those cases is that although Greenspan, over the long run, was pursuing um, a, a, a tight monetary policy, and in fact, if you look at the monetary measures, tighter than what Volcker had been doing, um, in each of those cases, he initially. Uh, floods the economy with liquidity until um, the stress uh, has disappeared and then pulls it back out. 
Um, and it's particularly clear in Y2K and 9-11. You see a huge spike. Uh, well, huge. You see, a, you see a noticeable spike in um, the monetary base and the reserves uh, of the banking system. And so I think that what Bernanke should have done was uh, beginning in um, August of 2007, started to uh, uh, increase uh, the monetary base. Um, and I think uh, open market operations would have been sufficient. Okay. Now, I have argued, as well as Scott Sumner, that the Fed blew it in 2008. And what you're arguing is that actually was before then that the Fed failed to act more aggressively in 2007. So Scott and I have argued that the Fed got really worked up about inflation in 2008 because of commodity price shocks. Um, if you go back and look at transcripts, um, even the, the statements, FOMC statements, there's this concern about inflation. And there was even you know considerations of raising rates. I've mentioned before on the show that if you look at Fed fund future contracts, they indicated, for example, in June 2008, that the Fed over the next year would raise interest rates to 3.5% from 2%. So the market was actually pricing in a rate hike during this time, the worst time possible, because the Fed was really talking up its concerns about inflation. But you are, you need to go before 2008, back to 2000, starting in 2007 when the Fed did sterilized lending. And, right. And again, it goes back to – you bring the point, it goes back to this this focus on – um, the financial in intermediation view of the crisis. But I guess kind of stepping back, both my perspective and your perspective, could you argue that it's, it's really a, a myopic focus on low inflation? In other words... Yeah, no, I agree that, okay. that the reason he sterilizes... I mean, it, it, it's a classic example of what's wrong with inflation targeting, <laughs> okay. uh, which, you know, I mean, inflation, inflation targeting... Uh, uh, um, uh, can work under certain certain circumstances, but not under um, all circumstances. And and I and I think what I think part of the problem was that with the you know you, you had um, you had uh, oil prices and energy prices spiking, but it was a relative price change. Mm -hmm. uh, not really uh, an increase in. in uh, in, in in the long run rate of inflation, so it was sort of like a supply side shock, um, and uh, inflation targeting doesn't do well with supply side shocks. Yeah, I think I agree with that assessment entirely, and I think the ECB made the same mistake in two thousand eight and two thousand eleven, yes. doing this, the same thing. Overly concerned. I mean, the economy is clearly going down, which by all other measures would indicate weakening of demand, but the Fed kind of. In, treated this inflation shock like more of a demand shock when it was a supply shock. Now, let me just let yeah. me just make the case for um, starting the <laughs> responding in 2007. Mm -hmm. Remember that um, it's June 2007 when Moody starts its downgrades yep. of mortgage-backed securities, and that's when the problems show up in the two Bear Stearns uh, managed hedge funds that eventually bring the company down. In August 2007, you also have the run on the French bank BNP uh, Paribus. So by the end of, the, by the end of 2007, the repo and, and um, asset-backed commercial paper markets are already in free fall. Yeah, so they, they could have been – they probably could have been more aggressive even before August 2007. They could have – been signaling, um, right? I, you know, let me again. Let me step back. A greater tolerance for inflation flexibility, or, or, or tolerating a little bit higher inflation temporarily. I mean, I, stepping back even, even more, looking over the past decade, we, we have a decade now behind us since this erupts in 2007. And I think one of the big takeaways is that inflation targeting is limited. That that it, this commitment to to really low inflation, whether it's it, an unconscious thing, or it, or maybe it, it's it's something they purposely have done. It has persistently undershot its target of two percent. Um, now it's easy to understand why it undershot during the, the crisis, but even since June two thousand nine, it has undershot its the two percent target. So, I, I when I look at this, what I see is this this commitment to low inflation. Um, hampering the Fed's ability to be to respond appropriately 
and, and moments of stress. Uh, yes, I, I agree. But notice that under um, Greenspan, he was he was committed to low inflation, but that didn't stop him when there was an incipient crisis um, from flooding the system with liquidity. No, absolutely. That, that's where I, I really stress inflation flexibility. A true flexible inflation target you would tolerate overshooting. You wouldn't necessarily be aiming for inflation uh, overshooting, but you would tolerate policies that might might cause it. All that matters is in the long run, you, you keep inflation anchored. In the short run, if there's a temporary overshooting because you're expanding to stem off a financial crisis, that is something that should be tolerated. But it wasn't. And, of course, as you know, that's why I advocate some kind of level targeting, like nominal GDP level targeting. But let's go to phase two. So phase two, they do QE. And that same type of thinking in terms of, of this being a credit crisis kind of plays into that as well. I mean, I, I know Bernanke, for example, contrasted – QE in the U.S. with QE that was done in Japan. And he said, look, we're doing credit easing. What they did was, was you know, more reserve or monetary base easing. And and I think and that's one of the, the, the challenges of why QE wasn't as effective as it could have been. I think QE1 did pack something of a punch, QE2 and QE3 less so. Um, but I, I at, at a minimum, you can see that the driving – ideas behind it are very similar to the ideas that drove the response in 2007-2008. Yeah, well, particularly um, the policy of, of starting to pay interest on reserves. Um, so that, in other words, Bernanke's run out of uh, Treasury securities to sell to sterilize um, uh, his bailouts. Uh, he realizes uh, he, he needs to actually do more in the way of bailouts or more in the way of expansion and um, a, and is worried about inflation. So how, how do you prevent um, an increase in the Fed's balance sheet from generating uh, higher inflation? Well, you uh, give the banks an incentive uh, to hold more reserves. So you pay interest on reserves, and and he actually is explicit um, about this in in his uh, memoirs. Uh, and so what happens is that the monetary base goes up, but uh, as the banks accumulate and eventually accumulate over a hundred percent reserves behind M one, the money multiplier uh, collapses, and so the impact on the on the broader measures of the money uh, stock. Um, is is very is diminished significantly. Now, taking the Fed side on this, just for the plain devil's advocate here, they would say the reason we do interest on excess reserves is because it gives us more flexibility. It's a new tool, a new way to manage uh, policy. Um, yeah, we introduced it. In October 2008, and maybe the original motivation was to contain the, the massive growth in um, reserves, but we want to keep it because it allows us to set in short-term interest rates without having to worry about managing the quantity of reserves. How would you reply to that response? Well, I would I would first point out that uh, well. And, and and to to um, say something else on their behalf, other central banks had already begun right. paying interest on reserves, so it wasn't an unprecedented thing to do. Mm -hmm. But um, initially, the plan was to set up a corridor system uh, in which uh, <clears throat> uh, the Fed would target the federal funds rate, uh, use the discount rate to um, – uh, as an upper bound on the federal funds rate and use the uh, uh, interest rate on reserves um, as a lower bound. And, and they again, they're explicit about this is the goal. And of course, it doesn't, <laughs> doesn't even work out that way. And, and in fact, the uh, because the banks are holding so many reserves, uh, the interest rate on reserves becomes actually an upper bound on the federal funds rate rather than a lower bound. Yeah. So it becomes more of a floor system. Yes. Than a quarter yes. system. And yes. and again, you know, they will say they, they like this. It it works for them. Um you know, one of the big critiques I know that George Selden has been making is you know, one of the reasons to think about it, to step back and pause and consider whether it's working well is the fact that they haven't hit their inflation target. Um it it may give them the, the flexibility that they want, but the past eight years, nine years, 
indicates they're having a hard time using this this new tool in an effective manner to hit their inflation target. I agree, yeah. Well, let's move on then to, to another article of yours. I think there's a nice segue here because, you, as you know, uh, the Fed lowered its interest rate targets down to zero, gets the zero lower bound. Um, it resorts to QE as a workaround solution to provide additional stimulus. And once we get to this point, we get these massive critiques of the Fed. The Fed is artificially lowering interest rates. It's rigging a system. It's harming savers. It's just a terrible intrusion in the private marketplace. And you have written an article that's entitled Central Bank's Control Over Interest Rates, Myth and Reality. So speak to us about this common view of the Fed's control over interest rates and then tell us what's wrong with it. Well, I um, I make a distinction in the article between the popular view of the mm-hmm. general public and um, the view of uh, central bankers and monetary economists, which is um, more sophisticated. The popular view is, um, a- a- and you still see it, um, is that um, the Fed sets interest rates uh, and um, essentially has um, complete control over interest rates. Um, now, monetary economists have a more sophisticated uh, view. Um, they realize it's more re- uh, complicated um, but they're, first of all, responsible for the popular misconception because they persistently and misleadingly describe central bank policy as controlling interest rates. And um, moreover, I think they overstate the strength and significance of the uh, central bank's impact, uh, particularly on real interest rates. And this has led to um, a mistaken focus on interest rates as, as both the target and indicator of uh, monetary policy. In other words, um, I don't think you can't – in other words, as you mentioned, the goal is to try to separate <laughs> um, monetary policy from what's happening to the money supply by focusing on interest rates. Uh, I don't think you can do that. I think uh, it, it's a mistake to try that. Um, it's not going to work, and it's one of the reasons that they're not be able to hit their inflation target. Well, kind of tying this into Fed policy, so when the Fed does get to the zero lower bound in late 2008 and, and 2009, it goes on, that's when you see these critiques emerge. And what I think your paper argues or makes the case in saying that is interest rates were going down – regardless of what the Fed was doing. So in other words, the, the Fed lowered its its target interest, the target for its short-term interest rate, but the actual market rates had already fallen. And in fact, the market clearing or equilibrium interest rate was was falling even beyond zero. And the Fed, of course, can't go below zero because people at some point would resort to cash. Now, we've seen the interest rates can go a little bit below zero, but but at, still this, this constraint is binding at some point. Um, it becomes worthwhile that the benefits exceed the cost of moving into cash. So the critique is that the Fed artificially lowered rates when instead the collapse of the economy pulled rates down and the Fed simply followed it down. That's that's the argument you make in your paper, correct? Yes, yeah. and Well, that the market ultimately determines real interest rates. Mm-hmm. Um, the Fed has some control uh, has control over the extent to which nominal interest rates exceed real interest rates by its long term control over inflation. But the market determines real interest rates, um, and that therefore, if you have a an extended period of low interest rates or an extended period of high interest rates, it's not the responsibility um, of uh, the central bank. It's not being caused by the central bank. Uh, in the short run, the central bank can uh, push up uh, um, uh, interest, real interest rates up or down a little bit. Uh, I think the extent to which they can do that uh, depends on uh, the economic environment. Um, uh, but uh, these, these short-term effects are not going to last and and the the underlying theory that's taught in all the money and banking textbooks is that it doesn't last um, uh, for extended years. Um, that it's only a, a, a short run impact, uh, pushing uh, real rates slightly up or slightly down. 
Yeah, so I think what gets confusing about this is that the Fed does have some short-run controls you mentioned, and that short-run control is more binding, more more uh, prevalent during normal periods when interest rates are above zero. But when you get to the zero lower bound, the Fed loses almost complete control uh, of using interest rates because if if in fact the market has pulled the equilibrium or neutral interest rate below zero, there's nothing the Fed can do with interest rates other than adopting some negative interest rate policy. If it's above zero, then you can think of the Fed having some effect on the margin. And people, I think, generalize from that to any period, including a zero lower bound environment, which is, I guess, one of the consequences of using interest rates like we do for monetary policy. Let me ask a slightly different question. So another critique that you often heard over the past decade is that interest rates don't matter that much for um, you know stimulating the economy. Um, a lot of people have said this. You know, it's 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 some other channel through which monetary policy works. The new Keynesian kind of paradigm is monetary policy affects the stance of, of monetary conditions by um, adjusting the short-term interest rate path or the expected path of interest rates relative toward relative to the equilibrium path. And so that gap between the natural interest rate path and the actual interest rate path is what sets the uh, stance of monetary policy. Do you think the Fed packs much punch by altering that gap, or is it through some other channel that central banks have uh, their effect on economic conditions? Um, I'm not sure. What gap are we talking about? The gap between the actual short-term interest rate that we observe and the equilibrium one. So, you know, if, if for example, if the economy is heating up, and you know market forces are pulling up interest rates. The return on capital is going up. People are wanting to borrow more credit, so the natural interest rate is rising, and the Fed decides to keep rates low, even as as the market forces are p- pushing them up. That that gap would indicate a stimulative stance of monetary policy. Um, it's, well, well, my my argument is that the Fed doesn't doesn't have much uh, influence in creating the gap. In other words. Um, I don't think you you kept using the word control over interest rates. Mm-hmm. They have some influence over interest rates, okay. but I think the extent of the influence is very limited. Um, that then, in other words, the the Fed, um, in theory, could temporary could could um, uh, push. Uh, the na- push interest rates below uh, the long run equilibrium, the natural or what's called sometimes called the neutral rate of interest. Yep. Um, over an extended period, um, only if they um, increase the rate of monetary growth and generate a high high rate of inflation. And and so I think that um, I think we need to return to looking at the money supply rather than interest rates as sort of the target and the indicator of what mo- what what monetary policy is um, doing. What about the Fed's view on QE? So when they did these large-scale asset purchases, they um, invoked the portfolio balance channel theory, which argued that they could affect interest rate yields on a number of assets by taking out these safe assets, take out treasuries, take out agencies. It, right. It, 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 they, by doing that, they took out duration risk. It caused a rebalancing of portfolios, which to, in turn affect other yields, kind of a cascading effect on interest rates. And what they were doing, of course, is they're turning to long-term interest rates because short-term rates had gone to zero. Do you think that was a very effective approach? Um, I don't think it was an effective approach for the problem that they were <laughs> interested in solving. Okay. In other words, um, my view of, of quantitative easing, easing or the uh, large-scale asset purchases is, is that most of the money that the Fed has used to engage uh, uh, in, in those operations is not, is not money that it's created, the traditional way that central banks operate, but money that it has borrowed. Um, you saw this at the beginning of um, uh, quantitative easing when uh, temporarily you, the, the Fed, part of, the, part of that quantitative easing, which was going into um, 
foreign central banks was being financed by the treasury borrowing money, um, depositing it in, a, in its uh, account at the Fed, and then the Fed re-lending it to foreign central banks. And to a certain extent, interest on reserves is a way of, of redirecting the lending of banks um, from the economy to uh, the Federal Reserve, which then allocates credit. So in other words, the, by paying interest on reserves, um, the Fed has become, um, ha has expanded beyond an institution that controls the money supply to becoming also a giant financial intermediary that borrows on one end of its balance sheet and relends on the other end of the balance sheet. And of course, that can affect, have some impact on the structure of interest rates. In other words, it's like Fannie and Freddie. Fannie, Fannie Mae and Freddie, May, Freddie Mac have some impact on the structure of interest rates, where the credit flows. And I think um, the Fed, through its financial intermediation, um, can have that kind of impact. Uh, but I don't think that's, that those kinds of, of operations are what's needed if you want to stimulate the economy. So what you're, you're saying is that the that QE did not work very effectively, but it did turn the Fed into a large financial intermediary. Yeah, a financial central planner. Okay, central planner. And, you know, there's people who will acknowledge that. I've, I've talked to someone who works at one of our regional Federal Reserve banks, and he will readily, he readily acknowledged to me that, you know, yes, the Federal Reserve is effectively the largest fixed income hedge fund right now in the world. <laughs> <laughs> right, um, right. Four and a half trillion dollar balance sheet. Maybe there's some other hedge funds that are big. I don't think any other hedge funds are bigger than that. But, but it's a really large fixed income hedge fund. And he's like, look, we're making money for the government, right? We're 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 funding at the interest on excess reserve rate. We're earning on long term yields. We've been making you know hundred billion dollars or so a year lately for the federal government. What's there to, to dislike about that? Why not do it? Why not save the government and taxpayers some money? How would you reply to that? I would, I would reply that, um, that, that uh, just as Fannie and Freddie created enormous distortions uh, by misallocating savings, um, the Federal Reserve can do the same thing, and that ultimately – um, if you want your savings efficiently allocated, you should leave it up to the market, which, by the way, takes us back to Friedman's view. In other words, if you're trying to stem off a, a, um, a, 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 a financial crisis, um, if you're just injecting money into the economy, uh, uh, you're letting the market decide where the money should be allocated rather than the Fed deciding. Okay. Now, there are people, of course, who, who want to see the Fed's balance sheet remain large, even though the Fed has indicated it wants to shrink it. They think the Fed's large balance sheet provides a vehicle to provide safe assets to investors, to, to the public. Um, so, in other words, the Fed's balance sheet has, has opened its door to more and more financial firms beyond banks now. So many market funds, GSEs, can park their funds at the Fed through their reverse repo um, facility. And so they, they see the Fed's big balance sheet as this vehicle for increasing financial stability. I mean, Jeremy Stein used to be the Board of Governors. He's argued this. A number of people have taken this view. Um, but I think what I hear you saying is that in doing so, so the benefit might be some increased financial stability, but it also comes at a cost. The cost is distortions in credit allocation. Um, and I think, and you referred to Fannie and Freddie as, as an example. I think another lesson we learned from Fannie and Freddie is at some point they may not be profitable, right? Some point, for years they may generate <laughs> revenues for the government, at least the Fed is. At some point they could take a loss if there's big enough you know, swings in interest rates. There could be a huge loss in the Fed's balance sheet. And at that point the taxpayers would have to, to bear that loss. Uh, not only that, but but the the impact of um, I mean, it is true that the Fed's remittances to the Treasury um, have gone up significantly since it expanded its uh, balance sheet. But you have to bear in mind that uh, the the that uh, the the uh, interest that the Fed is earning on all of these 
assets is partially offset by the interest that it's paying on reserves. And as interest rates um, uh, go up again, which I think they ultimately will, um, uh, it's not clear how much of that, you know, what, what are going to be the long-term effects in terms of revenue for the treasury. And in fact, I mean, seniorage has never been an important source of revenue. Oh, pardon me, never been. Uh, senior, seniorage in developed countries um, in, the, in the late 20th century and, uh, and 21st century uh, became a trivial source of revenue. Uh, uh, and, um, and so the Fed has increased its seniorage. So maybe now, you know, I'm not even sure it, it's even reached, uh, um, 1% of GDP, uh, as a result of, of, um, uh, uh, of the increased remittances to the treasury. Yeah. It's interesting. If you read the discussion of FOMC members, Many of them do recognize the expanded Fed's balance sheet is effectively a, a creepy nationalization of the financial system. That, you know, the, if they keep it large, they're effectively, you know, usurping activities that formerly were done by other firms. And some of them are uncomfortable with that. And I think it's one of the reasons they're willing to shrink the balance sheet. Another reason they may be uncomfortable with it, and I've written on this, and this is purely conjecture on my part, but one other reason might be the political economy of interest and excess reserves in the following way. Most of the payments that go to banks from interest and excess reserve are going to one of two institutions. One, foreign banks that have branches in the U.S., and second, large domestic banks. So the banks that we bailed out during the crisis and then foreign banks are the ones receiving the lion's share of interest and excess reserve payments. And I think that's a really bad image to come before Congress and, and, and to discuss. It's just bad optics. And as rates do go up, those payments will get larger if the Fed does not you know, dramatically shrink its balance sheet. And, right. I, and I think that will be a hard um, sell for the Fed to make. Why they need to keep... Why are they making these interest payments to the, these, these foreign banks? I mean, I, I've looked at this data recently. So um, in 2015... These are kind, this is kind of a rough estimate here, but about six billion, I believe, six billion dollars um, in interest and excess reserve payments were made to banks. In 2016, it jumped about 12 billion. So there's a big increase. And of course, that that increase was due to raising of rates. And right. now, now, 12 billion may seem like chump change compared to the Defense Department, but as time goes on, that number will get a little bit bigger. And I, I just think that'll be a tougher and tougher sell for the Fed to make and why they're making these payments. Agreed. Okay. Let's then move on to another article you've written. And this okay. article is also about money, but it's on a particular form of money, and that is currency. Over the past year or so, there has been a lot of discussion about whether we need to get rid of currency. Uh, Kenneth Rogoff had a book, The Curse of Cash, where he argued along these lines. I believe Larry Summers made a similar argument and a few others. And you responded to this. You wrote a review that got published in which journal? Econ Journal Watch. Or Econ Journal Watch. We'll probably link to it. Thank you. And the title of the article was The War on Cash, a review of Kenneth Rockoff's The Curse of Cash. Now, interestingly enough, you wrote this critical review of it, and Kenneth Rockoff actually responded to your critical <laughs> review of his work. So why don't you first summarize his work and then provide your critique of it? Okay, well, um, he wants to uh, phase out cash for essentially two reasons. Uh, one is he believes that cash is significantly important in the underground economy, uh, for illegal uh, activities uh, such as uh, drugs, um, uh, human trafficking, uh, um, <clears throat> uh, illegal immigration. And so he um, sees this as a, a mechanism for suppressing crime uh, because uh, criminals rely more heavily on cash uh, than others uh, do. and. Um, uh, going along with that is that uh, 
he believes it would force uh, more activities, the underground e activities, the legitimate parts of the underground activity, uh, uh, underground economy, um, uh, it, it, to being uh, more effectively taxed, so he thinks there'll be a tax gain for the for the U.S. government um, or any government that implements that. So that's one of the uh, arguments. And then the second argument is that if you eliminate cash, uh, it uh, it makes it easier uh, for central banks to um, push. Uh, into the territory of negative interest rates. In other words, if the central banks start charging negative interest rates uh, on the reserves that uh, private banks are holding, um, they can only push that so far as long as cash is there because uh, people can um, uh, flee into cash and banks can start holding their reserves in the form of all cash rather than uh, deposited at the central bank. So those are the two basic arguments uh, for phasing out cash. And Rogoff um, actually um, is, uh, is somewhat careful in making his proposal. Um, uh, in the book, he um, wants to phase out over a decade or, or more all large denomination notes in the U.S. That would be $100 bills, $50 bills, $20 bills, and perhaps even $10 bills. He also brings up the possibility of um, <clears throat> replacing uh, smaller denomination notes with um, uh, equivalent denomination coins of substantial weight that would make them uh, more burdensome to carry around and and harder to conceal. Um, he believes that for less developed countries, it's too soon to contemplate phasing out currencies. Um, so, um, uh, but he still thinks that uh, they can maybe do something with phasing out large notes. So that's his proposal, and um, <clears throat> uh, my objections to it are. Um, are first of all, uh, I don't think he he doesn't give any he doesn't give any convincing evidence about the extent to which, um, in fact, none of the advocates of, of phasing out cash have provided ex, uh, uh, good empirical estimates of of how much illegal activity would be suppressed. Um, they ignore the fact that some of that illegal activity, such as um, drugs and illegal immigration, actually consists of, uh, of uh, productive activity uh, that, uh, according to people's subjective preferences, they're better off. Uh, he doesn't do um, a full welfare analysis. In other words, if you phase out cash, um, you're moving um, uh, legitimate underground activity or non-invasive underground activity from tax rates of zero to perhaps marginal tax rates of 30 percent. Um, and given my views on the fact that central banks shouldn't be targeting interest rates, <laughs> I'm not a big fan of uh, of, uh, of the, the proposal to go to negative interest rates. I can talk more about that in, in, in detail uh, later. But And then, uh, then I think he ignores the value of the underground economy as, um, a, as a safety mechanism. Um, in other words, uh, we have uh, – it was um, Pierre Lemieux who made the point uh, that <laughs> – um, <clears throat> Uh, criminals may use uh, uh, some of the legal protections in the Constitution more often um, than non-criminals, uh, you know, protections, jury trial and uh, 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 search and seizures, uh, protections against self-incrimination. Um, and that's not a reason to get rid of them uh, because they uh, provide a break on government abuses. And... Uh, Similarly, um, the underground e economy um, uh, is an important mechanism for um, checking uh, when government uh, becomes too invasive. Um, I use the example of 
uh, alcohol prohibition and laws against marijuana. How likely would it have been if uh, it, that alcohol, that, that uh, prohibition would have been repealed if it hadn't been successfully evaded by a large part of the population? And similarly, how likely would we be today moving to marijuana legalization if it hadn't been uh, uh, the, uh, the laws against uh, marijuana hadn't been uh, so successfully evaded. So, so I'm a big fan of the underground economy. <laughs> Let's talk about that just a little bit more. So what you're saying is in the underground economy, there are sometimes some useful activities going on down there because um, policies that may have been intended well may have adverse effects on certain groups, poor people, uh, lower socioeconomic folks who – they operate on the margins of society because for whatever reasons, like a schooling, lack of opportunity, they're not in mainstream uh, America and they have to, to do it. So I think of maybe laborers or you know, maybe immigrants who um, maybe you know they, they're not able to find work um, in normal, a normal fashion, so they resort to being paid in cash um, under the table. And this actually keeps them employed, keeps them, you know, off the street, keeps them out of prison by being engaged in meaningful activity that they wouldn't otherwise be able to do. Is that kind of the story you're making? Yeah. Um, and um, and this is even I mean, there are various estimates of the size of the underground economy. Mm -hmm. And for the U.S., it's um, estimated that uh, that uh, if you counted underground activity in the national income and product accounts, it would increase GDP by around. 10%. But there are countries, um, even developed countries uh, like uh, uh, Italy, um, where the estimated size of the underground economy is, is close to 25% of GDP. And that's suggesting that, you know, the underground economy is where a large portion of the population actually lives and survives. Mm -hmm. and, and so, um, and it's, it's interesting to observe that you know the size of the underground economy tends to be larger, um, the more uh, invasive you know the higher the tax rates, the greater the regulatory burden, and all of these other aspects of government intervention are. Yeah, it's interesting to bring this up now because we've had guests on here, and it's a part of the national conversation right now. Some of the the regulations at state and local levels that are preventing. Um, labor mobility from, from happening like it used to, for example, zoning restrictions that keep the amount of housing supply low in your part of the country over there, you know, near San Francisco <laughs> or occupational licensing, things like that that prevent people from lower socioeconomic levels from maybe moving to where the jobs could be or getting the work they want to get. And the underground, like, like you said, the underground economy provides kind of a, it's kind of a social safety net and an unofficial <laughs> social safety net that keeps them, you know, keeps them going. And, and cash is the medium of exchange in that, and you don't want to stranglehold that last refuge they have. Well, I, I would I would divide the argument about the underground economy into two parts. Okay. Um, uh, the first part is you need to do um, a welfare analysis. In other words, uh, the underground economy uh, consists of both – um, a truly a, a invasive, violent activity, but also a lot of activity that um, involves producing goods and services that people desire. And so if you're going to uh, try to suppress the underground e economy, you have to, uh, by moving these activities um, into the regulated economy, you have to do a welfare analysis and see what to, what the, in other words, you may get tax gains, but you have to show that the tax gains would offset the losses, um, the, the dead weight loss from moving these kinds of uh, activities into um, higher, more regulated uh, um, zones uh, of the economy. So that's one aspect of it. And then there's the other aspect um, which is even if the welfare analysis showed that that the gains would exceed the losses, it still isn't a sufficient justification for getting rid of the underground economy because of its political economy um, aspects, because of the role that it plays in terms of uh, 
putting a check on um, the power of the state. I would add another argument, and I've, I've mentioned this before when I was talking to another guest we had on the episode with J.P. Koenig, and, and that is um, dollars are a very important part of the money supply for many people around the world outside the U.S. So, for example, in Zimbabwe, you know, the U.S. dollar is or was one of the main currencies used there. And a lot of our currency does get sent overseas, and it's it's a way for foreigners and, and countries that don't have stable monetary systems to have a stable medium of exchange. It's kind of like a public good that you know we provided the rest of the world. And I think it, this getting rid of it would be something that would affect them as well in an adverse manner. Well, let, let's move on to the, the the other argument given for getting rid of currency, and that's the zero lower bound argument. Or today we would say the effective lower bound argument because we know we can go a little bit below zero. <laughs> Um, but the argument is that in moments and in times like the, the Great Recession or the Great Depression, like we were talking about earlier, if if the natural interest rate, if the market clearing kind of equilibrium interest rate has fallen below zero and central banks in normal operating mode can't lower rates below that, um, one way to get around that would be to get rid of currency so that you could lower rates. In other words, banks cannot – central banks right now cannot lower interest rates into negative territory because at some point um, folks would, would start migrating towards holding cash as opposed to having their funds in a checking account or savings account earning a very large negative interest rate. Um, you, you don't buy that argument. Why not? Well, first of all, I don't think the policy is needed uh, because I don't think that um, – uh, you know, this gets back to my article on interest rates. I don't think interest rates are the important indicator of, of what's happening with monetary policy. Okay. And in fact, Bernanke himself, uh, when he wrote a couple articles on uh, Japan's uh, lost decade, uh, um, came up with um, the correct policy when um, you've got this apparent deflationary uh, problem, which is that um, it, it, if, is that the central bank um, can increase the money supply uh, um, as long as it's not borrowing money by paying interest on reserves, <laughs> uh, can increase the money supply uh, and it will eventually start driving up prices. In other words, the goal is obviously to stimulate the economy. It can it start driving up prices. Uh, uh, because it could keep buying assets until it owns everything in the economy. And at some point before that happens, um, people will start spending the money. So so I think the zero low around is a non-problem to begin with. If you're focusing on the money supply, you can get any stimulation of aggregate demand or any increase in the money supply, the central bank can, without um, worrying about interest rates. Um, now the problem is this. This is um, <clears throat> this scenario is often referred to as helicopter money, and it ac and that actually comes from uh, Friedman's work uh, where, when he was in one of his earlier articles was explaining why uh, increasing the money supply uh, causes prices to go up. Um, but what's happened is that is that the notion of a helicopter drop has been <laughs> coupled with. Uh, the idea that it has to be coordinated with fiscal policy. That's the objection that Rogoff gives, Bernanke gives that objection. There's no reason it has to be coordinated with fiscal policy. Um, the Federal Reserve, through open market operations, there are plenty of treasury securities, and if there aren't sufficient treasury securities, then it can buy other kinds of assets. It has already bought mortgage-backed securities. Um, some central banks are actually buying equities. So, so there's no reason why uh, um, the zero lower bound presents an obstacle to an effective monetary policy. So that's my first objection. My second objection is that I don't think it would be very effective because, um, because unlike um, expanding the money supply uh, uh, to um, stimulate aggregate demand or achieve whatever macroeconomic goal you want to achieve, 
um, the um, a, a negative interest rate uh, works on the demand for money, not on the stock of money. Um, in other words, it affects velocity. Um, and therefore, um, unless you're willing to start pushing negative rates successively lower and lower and lower, it's only going to have a, 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 a level effect. In other words, you impose essentially negative interest rates are a tax on money. You tax money, people spend it a little bit faster, you have a level effect. That's not as effective as, uh, as expanding the money supply. Um, so I don't think the policy would be um, – would achieve what it was uh, designed to achieve. Um, okay. And and on top of that, I don't think you should be taxing cash balances. <laughs> In the moments we have left, tell us about Ken Rockoff's reply to you. So you wrote these out. Um, you know, people can argue, disagree with you. What exactly did Ken Rockoff say to you in his reply? Okay. Well, much of his reply was sort of. I think he was really pleased to have somebody um, – uh, I mean, it was clear that I'd read his book closely and, and I had taken him seriously. Um, so um, it was a very respectful reply. And I would uh, – so a lot of it was devoted to just um, – uh, to him just uh, uh, explaining his views or – um, reiterating some of the points that he thought was important about his views. Mm -hmm. uh, I there, there are three things that are noticeable about his reply. First of all, um, and this is this th this first one also appears. There's a new there's a paperback edition of the Curse of Cash, and he's added an afterword. And you can see from his reply and from the afterword that he's backing away in terms of. Um, what he's advocating, or at least how he's presenting what he's advocating, because you have the impression when you read, um, you know, the title, "The Curse of Cash," um, leaves you with the impression that uh, that uh, even though he's willing to go slowly, his ultimate goal is to get rid of all cash at some point in the future. And in his reply to me, and um, and in the afterward, in the paperback edition, he's saying, no, 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 people are misinterpreting me. Um, I just want a society with less cash. In other words, he's trying to reframe his position as sort of a middle of the road <laughs> option between what we have and, and the extreme that other people have been criticizing. Um, so so that's, that's one uh, aspect of it, his reply that I think comes across very clearly. Secondly, he tries to um, answer my uh, objection uh, about uh, about the fact that he didn't do um, a welfare analysis by arguing that he was saying, well, uh, tax uh, revenue will um, – uh, that, that the that the change, uh, the abolition of ca cash will be revenue neutral. Uh, that was the implicit implicit uh, uh, assumption. In other words, uh, that and 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 if it's revenue neutral, that therefore there's no significant welfare loss. And and uh, I just I just think that that the assumption that uh, it's going to be uh, a revenue neutral change um, yeah, is is un undemonstrated and very improbable. In other words, what he's arguing is, uh, let me restate it. He's saying that once you, once you um, uh, move all of these underground activities into being taxable, you can therefore lower taxes on um, other economic activities so that the governments will, in essence, have more revenue coming from underground activities. And um, this will give them the opportunity to give tax breaks to other economic activity. And therefore, because of that, the, these other activities have been unfairly overtaxed compared to the ones that have been undertaxed. And, and it strikes me as utterly fantastic that 
to, you know, if governments, if actually the abolition of caste does generate revenue gains for government, that they're going to graciously <laughs> um, reduce taxes on other sectors of the economy. The third point is, is that he's conceded um, that really the case for abolishing cash is stronger um, for uh, uh, countries where there's a lot more corruption, a lot more underground activity. Uh, to quote from his response, he says, the case for pushing back on wholesale cash use is weaker for the United States than for most other countries. First, because perhaps 40 to 50 percent of all U.S. dollar bills are held abroad. And second, because the U.S. is a relatively hack, high tax compliance economy, thanks to its reliance on income taxes for government revenue. All right. So um, and yet at the same time, he said that it's too early to eliminate cash in third world countries. So essentially, he's saying that phasing out cash is less of a priority um, for the U.S. and for other countries. Um, uh, where it is uh, least needed, but easiest to implement. <laughs> mm -hmm. And that it's more of a priority um, where, um, it, in other words, it's more needed where it, it is could be disastrous to implement. Hmm, very interesting. Okay, we are out of time. Our guest today has been... Jeffrey Rogers Hummel. Jeffrey, thank you so much for being on the show. Thank you. It was my pleasure. Macro Musings is produced by the Mercatus Center at George Mason University. If you haven't already, please subscribe via iTunes or your favorite podcast app. And while you're there, please consider rating us and leaving a review. This helps other thoughtful people like you find the podcast. Thanks for listening.